My name is Joanna Reswick. I'm the coordinator of the German Classic Prize. This year's play is Schiller's Mary Stuart, or in German, Maria Stuart. And I'm very pleased to be with two students from Oxford here today, Fliss and Laura, to discuss the play. They valiantly travelled to Cambridge uh, in order to see it, which was um, the national tour of the Almeida production of Mary Stuart. Uh, it played in the West End this year at the Duke of York's Theatre, I think January to March, and then went to Bath, Salford, and finally Cambridge. The production originally ran at the Almeida from the end of 2016 to 17. I actually saw it in the Almeida, and it's a kind of lean adaptation of what is a relatively long play. Adapted by the Almeida's associate director, Robert Icke, it's actually quite interesting because Schiller's plays aren't very frequently performed in the English-speaking world, but I think for quite obvious reasons, Mary Stuart is the most popular. Uh, also, there's also an opera based on it, and the Almeida production comes just about a decade after the last major English-speaking production, which was at the Donmar Warehouse, I think, in 2005, then transferred to the Western, then even went to Broadway. What about the play itself? In broad terms, it concerns how Elizabeth I came to sign the order to execute Mary, Queen of Scots, who had been held in custody for 18 and a half years. It's a five-act play. It's written in verse in the original German. I think Ike tried in his adaptation to keep the patterning of the verse of the I Ams in it. And the centrepiece of the play is the third act, this invention by Schiller, this fictional meeting between the two queens, and it's a meeting that descends into quite some acrimony. I think it's quite an astonishing piece of political drama about two women in power who are parallels of each other. And that's reflected in the play's structure, which I'm not sure how much you're aware of as an audience member, so much as how you feel when you're reading the play, that we've got Mary in the first act predominantly, Elizabeth in the second, both of them in the third act, then back to Elizabeth in the fourth of these discussions of should I not <laughs> sign this order to execute her, then back to Mary in the fifth act until her execution, of course, and then we end with Elizabeth. So let's start off a discussion with this, this, this kind of question of parallels, dualities. So Robert Icke, I've looked through his translation and he has a couple of notes on it. He calls it a play constructed around doubles, mirrors, equivalences, differences and mighty opposites. And I think this particular production highlighted this idea of doubling from the very start because we don't know who's going to, who's going to play yeah, which absolutely. queen. So just, just talk me through how the play opened up the performance and what effect that had on your perception of the play. Um, so it opens with a coin being flipped and this is on a screen so you can see that happening up close so you can see. And so it's as though it's up to chance who is going to be in power, which I think is quite kind of topical in that though they were both heirs of the throne whoever was going to be in power was kind of up to Henry VIII and how he went about his life, which was not necessarily um, by the rules or he changed them. Um, and as they walk together up, up to the stage, they're walking in mirror image of each other. They, their bodies move as though they're looking at each other in the mirror and they're wearing the same outfit. So from that very beginning, it's not just the coin flip that has two sides, but it's how they move and how, what they were wearing. And even their haircuts um, kind of mirrored each other. And so I think from that very, very, very start, you have that feeling. I sure. think it's also important that it's Lester who flips the coin mm. because he's quite a kind of pivotal role for both of them because mm. he kind of pretends obviously to be on both of their side and you never <clears> really <throat> know which side he's actually on. Yeah. So exactly. he's kind of the deciding factor. So he's a, 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 the, the kind of third double, yeah. as it were. Okay, and how do, how do they play out then that split when we find out who's, who's playing what, which character? All the courtiers... Bow, bow to whoever's going to be Elizabeth mm -hmm. but they do that like this really and then weird take Elizabeth bow. away yeah. and remove her jacket so there kind of becomes a there's a change in that and they don't mirror each other quite so much anymore yes yeah. yes if I remember correctly doesn't Mary get dragged off yeah I think yeah, so. stage kind of screaming and it's all it's all kind of terribly dramatic but is it just a gimmick do you think it works do you think the play itself as you saw it really reflects that sense of doubling that strongly yeah, it's just a thing where, like, if you're talking about it, you know, with your friends or something, you can be like, oh, have you seen Mary Stuart? They, they flip parts, and it's, like, the big thing. And it is kind of just, like, a talking po point of the play. But then again, I think they, the doubling aspect was always there, because if you've got two central characters, it's 
quite an interesting idea to present them as very similar because they represent two very different ideologies, especially in yes. this place because it's Protestant Catholic. And like the difference between them is kind of the difference between which one will die and which one will live. How does how does then do you feel that the play deals with the sense of legitimacy or who who should be queen, who shouldn't be queen? Do you, do you find the kind of portrayals of this situation from both Mary and Elizabeth convincing? <laughs> I thought it was quite interesting how um, there was one line which really struck a chord with me because my dad is very anti-Brexit. There's been a lot of Brexit marches <laughs> recently. Okay. Uh, Anti-Brexit marches, not pro-Brexit marches. Um, but he... So there's a... I can't remember who says it. I think it might be Elizabeth. But one or one of the courtiers says just because there's a majority view for something mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's right. Yeah, this yes. is funny. This is something that I connected it to as well. Yeah. Right. In Elizabeth having to make this decision not because of her own opinion, because of what the masses wanted. Yes, and I kind absolutely. of made that connection saying that this is what people want now in this moment and is this something that will be wanted mm-hmm. in the future? And I connected that to Brexit yep. as well. Do you, do you think that's a legitimate point, though, for, for Elizabeth, that the, the reason that she gives is the people want it and I have to act in the moment? Well, we never really see the people. There's never, like, one representative mm-hmm. of the people who's like, yeah, this is what we want. Like, it's all just kind of second-hand. Yeah. So it might just be her using it as an excuse uh-huh, okay. she's scared for herself yeah. and she is kind of representative of the state in that weird way that sort of those 16th century 17th century monarchs are where like they are married to the state yeah, married to the people yes. yeah. and if they die Absol- like the state dies yeah. with them. absolutely and what are, what are Mary's kind of claims to the to the throne she's quite passionately defends her her rights did you feel drawn to Mary as a character in a way I that you didn't to Elizabeth possibly more so because she was more emotional in her reaction, more openly than yes. Elizabeth was. So when she speaks to her maids and her women, there's the emotion there. And when they meet, she is the openly emotional person and she speaks and she has that kind of verbal victory over, over Elizabeth. And I think that made me connect slightly more with her. But I think that last scene when you see Elizabeth trapped in her huge, ridiculous mm-hmm. costume that we haven't yes. seen before, we haven't seen them in that kind of... Um, Period dress. Period dress, yeah. exactly. And you see her so trapped in that and you realise actually, God, they're both victims. They're both victims of the situation they were in. It was shown that at the end, that it's not just Mary who was in this prison cell. And I think she describes the crown as a prison cell with jewels. Yeah, why, why do you think Robert Icke is kind of... So he, he's... I mean, he said a lot of things in interviews, but he says specifically that he thinks that period dress is just an aesthetic choice and a bit mm. stultifying, really, was the point. Mm. Hence why this production was modern dress. But why... Why use that image of Elizabeth? Because it's so renowned and we see it as a kind of like, this is her and her glory. Um, Mm. Whereas actually, I think this play makes you think about it another way and think that actually she is just trapped and restricted by this. And it's quite, (coughs) if I remember correctly, it's quite a long drawn out sequence. We see each bit kind of being put on. That is entirely um, this production, Robert Icke's view of how to portray Elizabeth abandoned by all her courtiers, even her most loyal courtiers mm. at this stage. I thought it was quite interesting how in that scene where you have the two of them on stage and Mary's being basically prepared for death and Elizabeth is being you know, put all the stuff on, like it's the men that are putting Elizabeth's clothes on mm. and the women are kind of preparing Mary. I thought that was quite interesting as well because Elizabeth's always surrounded by men and Mary is often with her, as you were saying, mm. with her kind of women, with her handmaidens. And there's also that kind of idea that she is a man, that she is yeah, like a yes. king. And so Just in a woman's body. Is Mary that much more in touch with her feminine, with femininity in some way? Is she better at exploiting it? I think so. I mean, they talk about her tears being something that really kind of plays on people's emotions and makes them connect with her. And that's why they don't want Elizabeth to see Mary. But I think the fact that she's um, in touch with her sexual side, that she has indulged in that, and that's something that's kind of contrasted with Elizabeth, that she supposedly doesn't, that she's celibate. And I think that kind of, that does make her more feminine and sensual in one sense, I suppose. To what extent is Elizabeth using her sexuality as well? Because Mm. you have these kind of tropes with Mary that she's, Mm. you know, kind of exploited men through a variety of ways. And we have, um, we can come on to talk about Mortimer and Lester as, as characters as well. There's quite clearly a sexual element in how Mortimer in particular approaches Mary Lester to to a lesser extent. Is Elizabeth as celibate as we'd perhaps think in the popu- think so in the popular imagination? I mean there are scenes where Elizabeth and Lester are kind of touching and 
sensual with each other. And I think there is definitely that part of her, but it's it's controlled. Even on stage, I think there was mm. there was that mm. sense of control and that uh, we can only go this far. Yeah, it's like one specific outlet. Yeah, exactly. Myself, yeah. With this. Yeah. I thought that was quite interesting as a, as a, a choice to do. What, mm. what effect did that have on you perceiving this character? Because I just naively thought that... No, Elizabeth is completely celibate. Mm. She acts. She's completely suppressing all aspects of femininity in order to be yeah. the state, the crown. And in fact, possibly, I think this might be right that we don't actually see Mary engage that like that with someone on stage. So actually, we're shown Elizabeth like that, not not Mary, and we only hear that Mary has this kind of background. Whose tragedy is it? Because Mary, she sheds all her earthly trappings in the fifth act, and. For Schiller, it's the kind of embodiment of the sublime, really, how she approaches death. Does that make her a kind of martyr, in a way, in this play? I think there's definitely the sense that she goes to death regretting nothing and being kind of free. Um, whereas, although restricted by death and obviously no longer in this world, although in another, um, there is an element that Elizabeth is the one who has not escaped anything and that is mm. in essentially the same position. That This is what kind of what Elizabeth was afraid of when she was like umming and ahhing over where this kill her. It was like, oh, we might turn it into a martyr and then incite the people against her. The difficulty for Schiller, I suppose, and the difficulty for an English-speaking audience is we know what's going to happen mm. and we have all these received narratives of Elizabeth as the kind of the great, a great queen. And this play has to portray how how difficult the political situation was, how fragile Elizabeth's position was. How do you think that actually... Did, did, it, did it succeed? There was a slight... I remember at the end of the first half, you hear that Elizabeth is dead. And this is obviously false news, that she's just been injured whilst travelling. And I remember thinking, like, oh, my God, they've changed it. Like, gosh, <laughs> this is such an interesting change to have made. And I think that does make you think, like, it does make you step back and be like, is this a story I know? Are they doing the same thing with it? And it reminds you of the fact that, actually, this could be different, this could be subverted. And although it does go back to the original um, plot, I thought that that was, that was quite That's interesting. That's a quite interesting kind of again, isn't it? Jolting you. Yeah. It's like it could have changed so easily. Yeah, exactly. You're talking about the kind of point of how historical, how historically accurate is the play. Mm. I think one of the only main characters who's invented is Mortimer. We touched on him briefly. What function did he fulfil for you? I guess he kind of portrays like the. I mean, because he's sort of got the zeal of the convert. Like he was originally Protestant and became Catholic, and he kind of, I guess, for me, sort of represented how much people believed in Mary and how much belief she inspired and people like kind of almost sort of representing the Catholic faith against mm. you know the oppressive Protestants. Then why does Mary recoil at him? There seems to be a degree of horror that mm. she... I thought it was a sense that she was like, I don't really want this burden, I don't want to represent something for people. And also he, she was so sexualised in his eyes and I think mm. that kind of makes this belief and this faith kind of feel strange. And he propositions her, and I think then it becomes like idolizing. I found it a bit. I found him quite a difficult character to deal with. He's so extreme, <clears throat> for a start. In the eighteenth-century context, people would have understood that he's a religious enthusiast. He's a kind of Schwärmer figure, which is the stock mm. figure in eighteenth-century literature. I mean, so you could argue <clears throat> that he's there. His purpose is to show how dangerous Mary is. But what about Lester, though? Because he seems to be like Mortimer, but an older version. Yeah. Of the other version, you kind of learn how to play the game mm, and okay. plays multiple people off each other. Yeah, yeah, in a more successful way. <laughs> how successful is he? How how good is he at this at this game? Well, it survives pretty much all of the play. His kind of duality and being this past lover of Mary and the kind of current dalliance with with Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, what what does he want? I, with Mortimer, it's clear. Mm. Hmm. I think Lester just wants to survive, and get some, like, maintain his position of power, whoever is in power. Okay, so he's a, he's a pragmatist. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's just hedging his bets yeah. with both of them. <laughs> he never work out what, what he actually believed. Yeah. Just a testament to the actor, I guess. But What are the other courtiers we have as well? Because I'd like to talk about this scene in Act 4 when it's Elizabeth and Davison and how that comes. I thought oh, Davison was great. Mm. He was really, really good. I agree. <laughs> How so? He's amazing. Um, 
just like the little fit, like he had a little, little tick where he would kind of touch his ear. That was great and really, really worked for the character. And like, because like his whole thing is indecision. What What did you make of that kind of scene of she signs the warrant eventually? But that doesn't actually say give this to Birdie. Mm. Yeah. She, she says something like, "You know what to do with this," or something. Yeah. And he's like, "No, I don't." Mm. And then sort of leaves that pushes the decision onto him, and then blames him for it later. Yes, is that entirely, is that a kind of absolutely calculated move by Elizabeth? I want to say, I want to say that it is, in a way, okay. in that she just doesn't, she's been forced into making that decision, but would then like to backtrack and be like, pass, well she doesn't even pass it to him, does she? She leaves it on the bench, hmm. um, and so there's not actually that, that order or that physical gesture of giving it. Hmm. So it's a hard thing. I think it's her, her kind of re- yeah, reacting against the decision in a way. She's like, mm. I don't want to make this, but yeah. I'm being forced to. Yes, I find, I find this ambiguity quite interesting mm. because it almost as if I want to absorb myself from responsibility, I feel compelled to do this, but I don't really want to do this. Mm. However, it would be politically expedient if Mary didn't exist. Although I think that the arguments are kind of quite nicely laid out by the various courtiers who have, mm. of course, their own interests that they want to pursue. Why is Elizabeth so indecisive? Uh, I, I wonder to what extent it is a kind of emotional mm-hmm. connection between the two. I mean, they refer to each other as sisters. They do, absolutely. Despite yes. being cousins? No, is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of just suggests this closeness um, and emphasises the relation, the blood relation between them, even though that seems to be something that they're, that Elizabeth especially is constantly kind of trying to forget about, that perhaps maybe the emotional connection... And the familial collection made made that so difficult to make, a decision so difficult to make. Could it be that Elizabeth, at the back of her mind, I mean, in the way the play portrayed it, it could be her at Mm. any point in time. This could easily be her, because there are a couple of references to her. At the flip of the coin, it could have been. It could have been been her, but there are a couple of references to Mary as well, but Mary, by contrast, would have no no moral qualms about Mm. sending uh, a relative to the stake mm. at all or to be beheaded yeah I mean it seems that like and a lot of the time there the, the stage is circular and they yeah. walk in circles a lot and it seems to be like history repeating itself with their father and him beheading people and his string of wives and treating them so and part of me thinks that perhaps she doesn't want that repetition of history yes. she doesn't want to be that figure the tyrant um, that is, is down as someone who has no qualms about um, and yet she's trapped by it at the same, yeah. at the same time. How do, I mean, what did you think of the staging in general? Because it's quite... I saw it in a kind of non... in the Almeida itself, where it's a non-traditional mm. space, so it's very much integrated into yeah, the theatre the, the back wall. wall back, yeah, yeah. 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 As we were coming on to seeing it in the Cambridge Theatre, I was like, oh, it's the back wall of the Almeida. Oh, wait, yeah. no, it's not. Did you feel it worked, this kind of very pared-back approach? It's very much Robert Icke. Like, I don't know if you've seen any of his plays... He did a yeah, he Oris Steyer at the Almeida. A couple of, I'd lived just by the Almeida, so I go quite a lot. And he did an Oris, Oris Steyer a couple of years ago. It was amazing. And was basically the same setup. Um, so I think it's very much his style to do it. And it also it kind of fits with whole not having period dress. Yeah. Like, just kind of stripping everything back to the basics. But I think sometimes it... Like, you do lose something from having okay. that simpler set. Mm. How so? I mean, I don't know how other productions have done it. But it might. God, I've been having to design a set for it on the spot now. But like, <laughs> you could have, you could kind of bring out um, Elizabeth and Mary's opposing, opposing and similar characters mm. in like the prison cell and wherever Elizabeth is. Yeah. For instance, there's the mention of um, Mary no longer having a mirror, which I thought was quite interesting, and that she can no longer kind of look at herself and be, I don't know, admire herself and have that kind of self. Um, involvement that maybe Elizabeth has more because she's surrounded by this luxury and that could have been brought out more in, in props and having them in two different contrasting environments. Yes, because that would be quite ironic as well because you would consider kind of Catholic environments to be that much more yeah, decorative, kind of decorative and, yeah, yeah. elaborate. But I think it kind of encourages you to see them as humans and to mm-hmm. tear away all mm-hmm. that you have that when you think of that era, you think of beautiful dress and elaborate mm-hmm. palaces and so on. Yes. Um, or is it closer to us, I guess? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, did, 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 did then the adaptation, the kind of the physical production, modern dress, 
the modern translation, I think the, the translation, as far as I can tell, maps quite closely to the imagery of the German. Do you think that works in kind of universalising the play that it's not just some sort of historical oddity or consigns it to a particular moment at a particular time, but it's actually about power dynamics that could exist in different ways today? In, of course, without executing, hopefully, your, your, your rival. <laughs> but crossed off. We both made the kind of um, connection to the Brexit idea. And we were saying that we thought this idea of having to make a decision and Elizabeth was making the decision on what the majority have wanted, what the people wanted, and was this going to be a lasting decision? Would they want this now? Is this a decision being made in the moment? And I think that we both um, said that that kind of brought that to mind. I don't know what, mm. in what sense you thought of it. Mm. I do think that, um, having brought up Brexit myself, I think there is a sense that we maybe only value plays if they can be universalised, especially mm. today, right. and especially if they're plays from like the 18th century. Like The reviews are always like, this is relevant to the modern day, because... Mm. And I don't think that is necessarily the best way to judge a play. I think Ike himself kind of realised that a little bit, at the same time as making it modern dress and making it, stripping it down and making it, trying to make it as um, sort of understandable, in quote marks, as possible to the modern audience member. He also, like the thing with the captions I thought was very interesting and the kind of the time ticking down. Because mm. um, that's, I've just been studying Brecht and that's quite a sort of Brechtian idea of like making it clear that it is... Yeah, act way, two has come. Yeah, yeah, act two is happening, like here's it's act two. You're being distanced from it all. And exactly, yes. Yeah. And yeah. also the bit at the very beginning where they do the coin flip, which is kind of outside of the play, but is also part of the play. 